Every sacrifice. Every day at home. Every covered face. Every wipe. Every step aside. Every 20 seconds. Every friend unhugged. Everything we're doing is helping stop the spread of COVID-19. Let's keep going. That was a public information film from the UK government. Now on BBC One, Panorama with Naga Manchetti, tackling what can be a difficult conversation to have. Let's talk about race. <laughs> I just don't feel that comfortable in a lot of spaces as a black man. The only disease right now is the racism that we're fighting. Last year saw an explosion of anger on our streets. The death of a black man in the United States raised questions closer to home. Let's work peacefully, lawfully, to defeat racism and discrimination. Why are you spraying on war memorials? Why are you burning British flags in the name of racism? The clubs say they were proud to stand in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement by taking a knee. Get on your knee for me! Get on your knees for me! Get on your knees for me! Everywhere, people were talking about race. More than 21,000 complaints. We, black people, get the feeling that people want our culture, but they do not want us. Everyone had a view. You are a white, privileged male who has no oh, experience. Oh. There's no way you can feel or live my life unless you have that shade of skin. I've travelled across the UK to talk to people about their experience of race. I am white, privileged, but I'm not going to apologise for that. Britain is a racist country. <laughs> with the face that we have, we're, we're walking around with a target on our back. And to ask, is the past year changing how we see ourselves and others, whatever the colour of our skin? The black British experience is just completely different to the white British experience. Black people don't want to be seen through a prism of victimhood. We are British, we are part of this society. How many generations do we have to be here to belong? I'm Naga Manchetti, and I'm a BBC presenter. How I feel about race came to a head for me when we were reporting on this story. The US House of Representatives has condemned comments made by President Trump. Donald Trump's tweet telling four US politicians of colour to go back to the crime-infested places from which they came really hit a nerve. When a co-presenter asked me what I thought, I couldn't hold back. And every time I have been told, as a woman of colour, to go home, go back to where I came from, that was embedded in racism. How do you feel then, as somebody who's been told that before, when you hear that from Furious. Him? When you hear that from him? Absolutely furious. And I can imagine that lots of people in this country will be feeling absolutely furious that a man in that position feels it's OK to skirt the lines with using language like that. One viewer made an official complaint, saying I'd overstepped the mark by expressing an opinion a very public row erupted. Part of me does wish the Trump incident hadn't happened, but I was furious because I know how it feels to be told I don't belong and to go home. I, like so many people of colour, have experience of this simply because of my skin. I'd kept a lid on my feelings for so long, like many others. Then almost a year later, when George Floyd was killed in the United States by a white police officer, simmering resentment exploded into angry protest. I wanted to understand the anger and headed to Bristol, where the city's colonial past was under attack. 
In Bristol, a statue to a 17th century slave trader is torn down. Holston and trafficked thousands upon thousands of Africans across the Atlantic in slavery. For more than 125 years, a statue of slave trader Edward Colston stood proud in the city centre. For years, Sean Sobers was part of a campaign to get it taken down legally. This is the plinth that Colston's statue was on. Um, it was dragged down. And then where did it go? Yeah, so it's dragged down. You see the crack there on the pavement where it hit? And then it got dragged down the road here. There's kind of scuff marks all the way down. Cast in bronze, now daubed with graffiti, one of Bristol's most famous sons. The thing about Bristol and the, the symbol of statues is like, how can we be expected to move forward if we're not really dealing with the past if we're not really taking the, you know, what actually built the fabric of the city and not, not, really, not fully owning up to that. There's kind of a discourse that is like, yeah, the black people took it down. When you actually see the sea of faces, there's a majority white crowd there. What we witnessed yesterday was mob rule, which is completely out of kilter with the rule of law and unacceptable. In London, other statues and the cenotaph were attacked. Across the country, counter-demonstrators took to the streets. This is what we've come here to do, defend our history and our memorials. In Bristol, Nigel, who's a scaffolder, feared the city cenotaph would be attacked. As people gathered, he joined a crowd that wanted to protect it. It's a sacred to the memory of Bristol's sons and daughters who made the supreme sacrifice. What does that mean to you? what my grandfather fought for and uh, is our heritage is what we're proud of. As more people arrived, Nigel jumped on the now empty Colston plinth opposite the cenotaph. You felt the urge to get up there? Well, yeah, because I couldn't see nothing from back here. Oh, so you wanted a better viewpoint? Better viewpoint. I thought it would be better to get up there and shape. The media came from everywhere, and I was like, oh, this is not good. I knew myself it was not going to look good what from did you the think? minute I was doing it. But I just carried on doing it. I thought, this is our time to show you. You're not going to come and spray on these memorials. Why are you spraying on war memorials? Why are you burning British flags? It's nothing to do in the name of racism. I just can't link the two together. You know, protest, BLM protest, do it and be proud of it. But. Keep, keep this stuff out of it, it doesn't make sense. Do you think you were perceived as a racist that day? Oh, terribly, yeah, of course I was. I've lost, I've lost some work over it through some people ringing up, telling people not to use me for fun work-wise and I stuff like that. Nigel says his actions weren't fueled by racism. Passions had been aroused on all sides that day. It wasn't just about statues and monuments. In Bristol, protests in support of Black Lives Matter continued for months. Please make sure you're wearing a mask and you're social distancing. They were part of a global movement calling for racial equality and justice. How can the criminal justice system keep our respect and its integrity? 20-year-old basketball player Corey was on one of the marches. It kind of just makes me think about the problems that are here in the UK as well, and that it's not just an America thing, it's really, it's here as well. When we get an opportunity to do something, it's better to take action rather than stay at home. I just feel like there's a lot of prejudices that I think I've experienced in secondary school, and just beyond that, just out in society, I just don't necessarily feel that comfortable in a lot of spaces as a black man. Um, just in my day-to-day -day life. I went to meet Corey's family. Oh, Hello, how Vernon. You? Very well. How are you? Dad, Vernon, Hi. Grandma, Hermie, and Brother Taylor. Hi. Hermie came to England from Jamaica in 1961. The arrival of more than 400 happy Jamaicans 
They've come to seek work in Britain that will help the motherland along the road to prosperity. People in my age group were leaving for England. The grass is always greener on the other side. And it's like, well, I wanted to come to see what's what happening here. Were you welcomed by the English? Are you joking? <laughs> We're still not welcome. Hermy worked as a nurse and says she had her first experience of racism almost as soon as she got here. I worked at the hospital and I went to change this old lady. She was soaked in urine and I was going to change her. She said, don't touch me, you black creature. No, I could not understand because that was the very first time I experienced blatant racism. When Hermie arrived, there were no anti-discrimination laws. In Bristol, the main bus company was able to bar non-whites from working on their buses. You agree with the colour bar? Uh, on the buses, yeah. Well, we don't want them on there, that's the main reason. There ain't going to be enough work for the whites, let alone the blacks. A bus boycott was called in protest. After four months, the bar was overturned. Vernon's father, Norman, became the first black bus driver in Bristol. Can you talk to me about your dad? How was he treated? Well, I would say, first and foremost, that I was quite proud for what he did and what it represented. Often people refused to get on the bus because he was a black man. And I can't imagine how that must have made him feel that he was just doing his job and people literally would physically stop at the door if they saw him. So how does Corey think things have changed since his grandparents' day? Like, I always have quite a positive outlook on life and race, but a part of me is like, it's not that bad anymore, Grandma. Like, it's not like it was in your day, but things are still not where they need to be. Meeting three generations of the family made me think about my upbringing. I grew up here, in South London. My dad was from Mauritius, mum was from India. Both were nurses. Like Hermie, they too suffered racial abuse at work, and they were called the P-word. I've experienced racism too. You never forget your first time. I was seven when someone I thought was a friend at school said we could no longer hang out because I was a P-word. The sense of shame was overwhelming. I was told I didn't belong when, up until then, I assumed I did. From that moment on, I knew I was seen as different. You know, that first hurt never goes away. Back then, I couldn't have imagined the life I have now, doing a job I really love. People don't say outright racist things to my face anymore, but they still say them online. Here's an example of what I get in my inbox. Why don't you get off our BBC TV and radio? You're like a bad smell. You're everywhere. You would never have got such employment in your home country of Pakistan. The BBC ought to keep your likes well away. Last year, police in England and Wales recorded 76,000 incidents of race-related hate crime, including online abuse. The police are better at recording these sorts of crime now, and more people are reporting them too, but that's still an increase of 67% since 2015. Kalwant Bhopal has spent 30 years researching the experiences of ethnic minorities in the UK. And what was really significant about Black Lives Matter was that it brought race to the forefront of everybody's mind. And it's actually made people think about how racism works. 
racism has changed. So when my parents came to this country back in the 50s, they were called racist slurs, and I myself was called racist slurs when I was at primary school. So that is less likely to happen. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but it is less likely to happen. Racism is always below the surface, and quite often what happens is that there is an event that triggers that racism off. One community in particular was reminded last year of how quickly racism can come to the surface. As COVID spread across Britain, some people of East and Southeast Asian heritage were targeted. I've lived here for my whole life and Racism has never not been a part of my life, but in the past year, it just feels like it's a threat all the time. Donald Trump calling it the China virus. People feel like it's more okay to voice their opinions. Thea is a medical student. She grew up here in Edinburgh. I normally would wish happy Chinese New Year, but after last year's events and pretty much destroying the world, I say, sod you lot. Faya says she was shocked by anti-Chinese comments on social media. She says abuse was directed at her personally on Facebook. I just clicked on the comments and the first three were racist. Using racial slurs against me, saying that I should go back to my country online is where a lot of us spend more of our time now. So it's becoming increasingly um, prevalent in my life. And it's not just online. There were two women and they just followed me around in the store, shouting, oh, get away from her. Like, oh, look, it's the virus, or she is coronavirus. When these things happen, it, I do feel a lot of shame and um, just for being different. Police in Scotland recorded 128 race-related hate crimes last year against the Chinese community, which is up by two thirds. Other police forces reported similar trends. In London, the number nearly doubled in a year to 647 incidents. Thea is meeting Kimmy, who set up a support group. I wish I could hug you too. <laughs> Since the Black Lives Matter movement, mm -hmm. um, it's given people the courage to speak about these difficult issues and saying, no, this is not okay, like, this is not acceptable. You're just left feeling really isolated and really lonely. Alone. Yeah. And ashamed as well. Yeah. I mean, in our, our little uh, community, like, we don't talk about it. I mean, look, look at you. Kimi says she was attacked by a group of teenagers last year in a local park. There were kids drinking at the bench and a couple of the boys came up to me and they, they started saying Corona and then they started laughing and then they started throwing glass bottles at me. And then I had to like oh run gosh. down the steps. Oh gosh, um, I'm so sorry. I just feel like um, with the face that we have, we're, we're walking around with a target on our back. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what it feels like. This year especially. Yeah. One of the biggest things that we're trying to do is encourage people from the East and Southeast Asian community to report incidents and assaults. People feel, what's the point? And people feel very disempowered and um, just not want to have to go through these processes because they just, they're not pleasant. <laughs> Sorry. I think I laugh because I don't want to cry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, sorry, yeah. Sorry, it's just been a really tough few months. Yeah. Britain is a racist country, I know, because I live in it and I have to deal with this all the time. I don't mean every single individual is racist. The reason still that Britain is a racist country is because it's embedded in our history. It's very ingrained in our society. 
Bayer and Kimi have experienced direct, in-your-face racism. But there are other, less visible, covert forms of racism. It's hard to explain, and often it's not obvious. It's like when someone asks, where are you really from? That's telling. It makes me feel like I don't belong. And if I call it out, I'm being difficult. Regardless, it chips away at you. Covert racism is really, really difficult to prove. and can take the form of individuals not given eye contact, black and minority ethnic people not even being asked their opinion, people pushing in front of you in a queue. East London. Frankie, her brother Jason, and nephew Ezra have lived here all their lives. We're not treated equally as black people. You might just be on your normal day going to get shopping and you get, you get followed because they think because you're black, you're going to steal, or because you're black, you're going to start an argument. The other day, there was me ahead of the queue and a white lady behind me. And she got called over before I did. And I noticed that this white receptionist was continuously doing that. So she was avoiding all black people that were in the queue. And that was hurtful because I knew what that was. Frankie also works as a receptionist. The worst one for me is getting me confused with another black receptionist, or not even another black receptionist, but just another black colleague that doesn't even actually work in my department. We might not even look the same, we might not even have the same hair texture or anything like that, but we're all black. How easy is it to call out the racism that doesn't appear like racism on the surface? If you do say anything, you may be seen as aggressive or you may be seen as abrupt. So what do you do? You stand there and you keep quiet and you wait your turn and you keep composed. It's humiliating it's, as well. It's humiliating, it's horrible. People face that kind of thing every single day. Every single day. Frankie's brother, Jason, works in hospitality. I get the typical people come up to me and ask me for weed and the hip hop talk. I've been in situations where something has been stolen and I can feel, I've literally seen people in the shop turn and look at me. And I'm clearly not the guilty one. No one's actually saying, you're a N-word, you're a this. You can't see it. There's no way you can feel or live my life unless you have that shade of skin. So that's why maybe a lot of people are oblivious to it and they don't see it, they don't understand it. Back in Bristol, Vernon worries about how his sons will be seen. The starting point is trying to uh, debunk those stereotypes and um, avoid those labels that get you the reputation where people just say, yes, here's another black man who's, who's uh, got a chip on his shoulder. The reality is, is we live in a place and a time which, like it or not, isn't um, equitable in terms of how races are perceived. That's just the reality. And, and I want them to have an appreciation of that reality. Burden Samuels of Great Britain, the 23-year-old from Bristol Athletics Club. I was, you know, blessed with the opportunity to represent Great Britain at the Olympic Games, and I had a desire to go as far as I could. The jump, the hang, very nice indeed. And I learned that, I believe, from my dad, in spite of what people might have done or said, he was still going to push, and that's the same for me. Vernon broke down barriers when he was young, but his sons say they still faced them at school more than 20 years later. A couple of my friends were in between periods and they were going to the lesson and they were having a laugh, just being rough as, as boys do. They're like what, 14, 15, and then I think they were, it was getting a bit out of hand and then one of the teachers came by and said, oh, it's always the black ones, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, so, um, yeah. And, um, and you hear stuff like that and it's just like, whoa. A black kid might be talkative and then um, might answer back to a teacher 
and then that kid will get like isolation for like three days or something a white kid will get like a slap on the wrist like that kind of thing and every time like I had convos with my dad um, or my brother or anyone like play the game Corey you know like the rules ain't the same for you and everybody else um, you were told that yeah Vernon did you say that to Corey that yes. the rules are not the same for him Absolutely. as everyone else. Because what was very clear, he was becoming labelled, and that label was sticking. So he was getting in trouble. Part of my advice as a father, as a black man who was born and raised here, is don't attract too much attention to yourself. Do you think a white father has to say that to white sons? Certainly not. How does that make you feel? It makes me feel sad in one sense, but there is something about living life pragmatically. How do you feel when you hear your grandsons talk about curtailing a part of themselves in order to flourish in society? That I have moved from the, the place I've been since I've been here. It's as though nothing's changed. I've told them from their knees high to a grasshopper as the saying goes remember you've got to be twice as good as your white counterpart taylor and corey know that they can't show everything of themselves i understand that and i don't like the fact that i've lived by those rules too and it hurts Vernon to see that he has had to see his sons do the same thing. And um, I suppose it's kind of hurt me and surprised me that I'm facing up to it. Something that a lot of us have to do. I'm a strong believer in fairness. If I've done something wrong, then arrest me and charge me. Don't target me just because of the color of my skin. I should be allowed to feel as comfortable as everybody else. Single dad Jason is also preparing his son Ezra, who's 14, for how others may see him. I can't allow my son to be his true self neither. I can't allow him to wear the clothes that he wants to wear the way he wants to wear it, even though he's not harming anyone because I know how he'll be perceived. I will sit and wait for a phone call to come down to the police station. A lot of times you get stopped and you're told that you fit a description. Um, tall, bo uh, uh, black guy, dark clothing. As you can see, he has a camouflage top, black bottoms, green trainers. It's not a matching set, so he cannot be put into a box of being a dark person in dark clothing that matches the description. Does that frustrate you? Sometimes, yeah, because I want to just relax and like a black tracksuit and all that. But yeah, it does annoy me. I don't really let him out that much, which is sad, but I don't. I don't let him walk around with large groups. I know if he's on his own, he's seen as less of a threat. You can't turn around and say he's in a gang. How do you feel about that? Is that frustrating? Yes and no, because I understand where he's coming from. Usually, you get pulled over because you're a gang. Jason goes out of his way to protect his son from being stopped by the police. But I've followed him a few times because I want to see how he's acting and he's out on the street when I'm not there. Because that gives me an understanding of how he's perceived outside of our home. I'll pop up at a random spot and he'll be there like, where are you going? What are you doing? And he has to be able to answer me. You can't just be loitering, you can't just be hanging around because the police are going to go, oh, where are you off to? Where are you? you need to have an answer, right? you just be hanging around. Don't give any of them a reason to get into your life. Home office figures show black people are nine times more likely to be stopped and searched in England and Wales than white people. It's happened to a couple of my friends anyway, so I feel like it's gonna to happen to me eventually. Because of my colour, colour of my skin. Like, but I just need to deal with the situation appropriately.
do you have an idea of how you'll deal with it? Yeah, just be respectful, um, keep composed. All I can do is give him the knowledge, but sometimes I do have that thought, is it better for him to get it over and done with now so he knows what to expect? You don't know what every office is going to be like, everyone is an individual, but I do have that thought and I don't know the answer, if it's, but it's going to happen. Do you think Ezra will be having these discussions with his children? I would like to say no, but he will. Unfortunately, he will. Unfortunately. Andrea Thompson is one of the few black people who've made it to the top of the magazine industry. She was surprised by how some of her friends reacted to the Black Lives Matter protests. People just kept asking me about the movement and saying things like, why are people so angry? Um, you know, why, why are people marching on the streets in the middle of a pandemic? You know, I'm sure that, you know, racism doesn't really exist that much anymore. You know, it's sort of a, you know, it's a like 70s thing. She's written several articles explaining why she believes racism isn't a thing of the past. When you grow up in a particular country that's your home and you feel that very strongly that it is where you're supposed to be. So to have the sense that you don't belong can be very painful. I think if you're white, you've never experienced racism unless you have actually faced casual racism throughout your whole life, you would never know it was there. Andrea believes white people have a different experience of the world to people of colour. To be white in our society is a privilege. It just is. Because you can walk in to an office, a restaurant, a pub, and you will be judged by different standards and probably preferable ones to somebody who walks in with black skin. White privilege is the idea that white people have advantages over people of colour simply because they're white. It is controversial. Now, of course, privilege is more nuanced and comes in lots of different forms. And a black person you know, from Eton is going to come from a place of much better privilege than, you know, a white person on a council estate. But there's a fundamental privilege that comes with being white in this country. And I think that that has to be acknowledged. We're the most tolerant, lovely country uh, uh, in Europe. Let's Says celebrate our women. It's so easy to throw the charge of racism at everybody, and it's really starting what to get boring. What worries me about though. your comment is, you are a white privileged male who has oh, no experience. Oh. In Bristol, I meet up with Corey and his basketball mates to hear what they think. How uncomfortable in a group of people of all races is the phrase white privilege. Someone says uh, something like negative towards you, you kind of like protect yourself and be like, yeah, no, that's not me. Like I have had this happen to me or that happened to me. But then when you really delve into it, it's just understanding that like this inequality is there and everything that negatively goes on for people of color, like that hasn't happened to you. I think it does seem uncomfortable, but it shouldn't be. I think if there was somebody disabled and they said you were privileged to be able-bodied, we wouldn't be offended by it. I think by saying the word white privilege here just means you just haven't had to deal with racism throughout your life that's been an obstacle. Of course, you've dealt with other things. It doesn't take away from anybody's work ethic or things their past history, their family's been through. The topic of, of white privilege can be useful, that term, if it highlights racial discrimination. I think where it becomes divisive is if it's seen as the only issue and, and it detracts from uh, disadvantage among many people. I've come to Blythe, a coastal town in Northumberland. It's 98% white. 
Stephen works in a warehouse. His dad, John, who's now retired, worked in this pit as an engineer. It closed in the mid-1980s. The pit here was the biggest employer in life. The pit and the yeah. power station. I don't know what they're going to do to this site now. They're never going to create 1,700 jobs other for men, full-time jobs. I just think in certain parts of the, the country that are historically unfashionable and untrendy and are, are just pigeonholed as deprived, nobody's really that bothered. In the 1960s, Blythe was one of the biggest ports in the UK, shipping millions of tonnes of coal each year. Now, unemployment here is higher than the national average, at 7%. When I look around Blythe and I see a predominantly white population, does white privilege apply here? Yes, we are to an extent. You know, we were looked after and brought up well. So, yes, we are, or I am white privileged in that extent. But I'm not going to apologise for that, um, and I do don't feel, feel you've guilty. Been asked, do you feel you've been asked to apologise for that? No. <laughs> that was past no, no, but to a lot of the young people growing up in Blythe, privilege is not a word that they associate with. It's white privilege when you, you get something that you haven't earned. I've worked all my life, I've got my own home, I have, uh, I have a good pension, but I haven't been given any of that. I've mm. worked for all that. How does that make me white, white privileged? No, oh, I've, I've worked for it. Well, you've never had to worry about race, have you? You've never had to worry about being discriminated against? I've never thought of black people and, and anything like that till, till this last 12 months. I've never been thought of racism till, till it's been thrown in your face that oh, everybody that's white's racist and everybody that's black's not. White teenagers from deprived backgrounds, on average, get lower GCSE grades than black or Asian children from similar households. Stephen spent years working in schools as a cricket coach. It doesn't surprise me at all that the statistics show you that young white males from working class deprived areas are underachieving. That just makes perfect sense to me. If I was a 16 year old again, and I was in a, a state academy um, in a small Northumbrian town. Um, and my, my parents aren't massively interested in what I'm doing or what I'm achieving. I don't know what help those guys are getting. I don't know who is taking an interest in them. You can see why the idea of white privilege might not go down too well in a place like Blythe. But across the UK, government figures suggest that white people are better off than most ethnic minority groups. On average, they earn more, are more likely to own their own home, and are less likely to be unemployed. Birmingham, the UK's second biggest city, and one of its most racially diverse. As COVID-19 spread across the UK, it emerged the virus was disproportionately affecting ethnic minorities. The impact of COVID-19 on black and Asian communities in the West Midlands is a medical emergency. People from South Asian backgrounds are being hit harder by coronavirus than other communities in the West Midlands. During the first wave, black, British, Pakistani and Bangladeshi men were at least twice as likely to die as white men from COVID-19. Data collected at the beginning of the second wave in England suggest that the gap has narrowed for black people, but has worsened for the British, Bangladeshi and Pakistani community. Working on the front line during COVID, I've been doing night shifts, I've been travelling a lot. It's an illness that we didn't know much about at the start and there was a lot of learning, you know, as we were going and a lot of people were becoming very unwell, so it was quite scary. Usman is a GP. Last year, he was part of a team that set up temporary sites to prepare bodies for burial. Concerns about infection meant that many Muslims were being buried without any religious rites. 
It was so traumatic for the families because uh, this was a part of their closure, a part of sending their loved ones off, and they weren't able to do that. He helped train family members and volunteers to safely wash and prepare their loved ones' bodies. Do you have an idea of how many friends, family you may have lost through COVID? It was a daily occurrence at the time. It was terrifying. We've never seen anything like that in our city. In communities where there's more poverty, there's an increased risk of things like heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. There's a direct correlation between poverty and those illnesses, and those illnesses are a risk factor for things like COVID. Usman lives in the Alum Rock area of Birmingham, one of the most deprived parts of the city. Alum Rock is a very close-knit community. Most of the houses are terraced houses, like you can see. Um, and most of the time, like, um, they are multiple generations living in one house. With us, it's like the grandparents, the nieces, nephews, everyone's quite close together. So a lot of the time in houses, you'll see like three generations or even four generations. Almost 60% of those living here are of Pakistani heritage. Usman's grandfather arrived in the 1960s. My granddad, when he first came over, he, his first job was as a road digger. So that was the kind of work they did. Um, and they were here to work. There was a lot of men all living together in one house, like eight, nine, ten men. And they'd have a designated cook. And they were working manual labor jobs in factories, uh, steel mill. What reception did they get? With my grandfather, great-grandfather, they did experience racism to a degree. I think. Uh, Overall, if you look at the experiences of my grandfather, my great-grandfather compared to my experiences, I think things have moved in the right direction. Have they moved quick enough? No. Uh, do they need to continue to move in the right direction and faster? Yes. Black groups and Pakistani and Bangladeshi groups tend to live in poverty, they have worse health outcomes, their experiences in the labour market are poor, they're less likely to be in secure employment. So there's less chance to make a difference and to break out of that cycle of poverty. So that cycle of poverty and that cycle of deprivation unfortunately reproduces itself throughout generations. Nikita Malik works for a centre-right think tank and believes the cycle of inequality isn't inevitable. I think it's very important to also focus on how people uh, in the UK uh, can, you know, get all the opportunities they need um, to uh, increase um, their, their aspirations in life. And, you know, that's what I think is interesting, that certain groups, that includes the, you know, Indian and Chinese have managed to progress very well and others haven't. So what were their experiences and, and can they be replicated? Back in East London, Frankie says she's tried hard to succeed. She's worked in health, retail and construction. If you look at the top of like every working environment, it's always the white man. It's never, you never really see a black man or a black woman. It's always a black person gets to a certain level and then they're suppressed after that. You could go to an internal job interview and you could have all the experience in terms of fit every single criteria and then maybe a white person would come along not as experienced as you, not fit in all the criteria but their face fits so they'll automatically get the job. It's not personal, it's, 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 around, it's all around, it's all around in the workplace. Can you call a situation like that out? You can but majority of the time as a black person, you don't, because you just don't want the battle. Especially if you've had it over so many years, it's kind of like you get tired almost of fighting. People that are both working class, but also are from particular ethnic minority backgrounds, suffer what we call double disadvantage. Afro-Caribbean, Pakistani or Bangladeshi young people do seem to be less likely to get 
to the interview stage, but there's also studies that look at earnings in the workplace, particularly in the early career stage. Uh, and again, it's those groups that seem to, to do less well. Usman is one of the first people in his family to go to university, but he very nearly didn't get the qualifications. I went to a deprived school. When I spoke to my careers advisor at school, they were like, you don't need to do GCSEs. BTEC is the same as a GCSE, so just do that instead. Um, but I, my mom, for some reason, she was like, you need to do GCSEs. Thankfully, because of that, I was able to kind of get do A-levels in the sciences, which is what I needed. I didn't understand the basics of how to speak in an interview, you know, uh, how to carry myself a certain way. And these are vital soft skills or life skills, which a lot of people, young people in this area don't have. I don't think it's purely due to the color of their skin. I think it's due to the opportunities that they lack as a result of the environments that they're in. Usman is helping other young people overcome the barriers he faced. Together with Sadia, a local teacher, he's giving interview tips to students and preparing them for some questions they may not be expecting. And getting there, there might be a few more barriers. I've gone to interviews where I've had a few too many questions about British values. I'm thinking, where is this going? And I know it can be intimidated when you're sitting there and you're a minority there. One of the things I was asked in the interview was, what do you think of the mosque in the university? You know, and then also after that I was asked, do you think the mosque needs an extension? And I was like, I really don't know how that's relevant to me wanting to become a doctor. And it's something that I asked a lot later on. Is that why the interview went badly? Sometimes it might be because of discrimination and other times it might not. Don't take failure, don't take rejection, don't take, you know, the struggles that we face as a given in our society. Really kind of just be strong in who you are. A lot of people from my background don't go out and move out for university. They have the grades, but they just don't because they don't feel like they'll fit in. People from those backgrounds like the Alan Rock, the taxi drivers, single mothers, and I think it comes down to confidence. Confidence is key because you know they say you can fake it till you make it, I suppose. Yeah, I think over the years I have I have accepted my culture. I realise that I can I'm always probably gonna be different. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, one day I might come in and smell of my mum's curry and that would be, make me different. Um, so I'm always, I just need to accept that I am kind of different and I just embrace it. Do you know what I felt? My parents were always really proud of their mm. culture and I was ashamed. Yeah. And now I've figured out that they were right. Yeah. I just didn't listen. Mm -hmm. Which is, I suppose, what lots of children end up yeah. learning. For these young people and others like them, Will confidence and pride in who they are be enough? I remember starting work and being one of the few people of colour in the office. Sometimes that's still the case, and it's noticeable. People always talk about recruitment, let's get more people, you know, and we need more diversity at work. But I do think that diversity is only part of the solution because it's not just about getting people in the door. Andrea Thompson is working with her own team at Marie Claire to try to improve things. If we really want to see genuine change, systematic change, then we need to look at recruiting people from different backgrounds and then retaining them by feeling like they belong there. I have spoken to quite a few young girls um, teenagers who say, I love the idea of getting into the media, but I feel like, you know, I'd have to tone down my afro, or I feel like I'd have to kind of like wear different clothes. Those sort of things have been said to me. Like, oh, would I be able to wear these braids? Like, would that be all right? And I, I'm just like, yeah, of course. But then, I mean, there are other, it, a lot of industries where perhaps that's, you know, maybe not acceptable still. A really big issue for us is diversity at the top. So who's on the board in the company? Who can I look to that has progressed in this organisation or this industry that is similar to me? Just 7% of directors of the UK's 350 biggest listed companies are from ethnic minority backgrounds, despite them making up almost 13% of the population. I think if we're not having diversity at the very top of these organisations, it's going to be hard 
to have systematic change at all levels. After the death of George Floyd, many companies endorsed the aims of the Black Lives Matter movement and pledged to do more to end discrimination in their workplaces. What we don't want is just box ticking exercises or you know, token people in those positions. Absolutely, uh, there have been initiatives, but they shouldn't just be for the sake of initiatives. They should be the, for the sake for people to actually be able to reach those positions who deserve them and, and retain those positions as well. It's against the law to appoint less suitable candidates just because of their skin colour. But lots of employers, including the BBC, have diversity targets. In Blythe, former mining engineer John still worries. A lot of companies still have a lot of apprentices. Now, is the government going to go to them and say, right, you must have 25% must be from black and Asian minority groups? If there's 200 applicants, and you want 50, 50 apprentices, it's the 50 best qualified ones. Do you have to say that, oh, well, no, it's got to be, if they, it doesn't matter what the qualifications are, they've got to have a certain colour skin. Well, that, that's, is that the way forward? Ready? Play? Four, yeah. My two major life passions, one is travel, and the other is cricket. I'm at the local cricket club to catch up with John's son, Stephen. He's doing Good. some coaching with his friend, Serge. Shot. Shot. The earliest memory I have of Serge was at Ashton Cricket Club, early 2000s, probably. When we won the league. Did you win the league? Yeah. Serge works as a training consultant. He helps run the cricket club as a volunteer. Tell me, what do the cricketers look like? Who would I see? Is it a diverse mix? In this part of the world? I think I've been the only <laughs> fixture that isn't you know, of, a, of a brown complexion mm -hmm. within Blythe, within the cricket clubs. Have you ever experienced racism? Yeah. In Blythe? Not in Blythe. Uh, growing up in Leeds, did experience racism. My brothers and I uh, growing up, not a Blythe. Never ever came, never, never been on my radar, being of a different colour, being in a predominantly white cricket club. Serge recently made a successful application for a £50,000 council grant to improve club facilities. I can guarantee there would have been some voices, locally and further afield, who would have said, Blab Cricket Club, we've got that grant, because Serge has done the application. Seriously? Really? Because an Asian man. Because an Asian really? man. Yeah. Yeah. Do you not think that would be the case? I wasn't, no, no I didn't even, no? uh, I didn't, wouldn't have had any inkling of that. Perception sure. whatsoever. I don't think that grant was given on the back of, you know, oh, there's a guy. Of course not, but there would have been some people that maybe, would have thought may, that. Maybe. From right, okay, okay, I hear what you're saying, right. Say, okay. say observers. If, yes. Observers. Say yeah. if another club yeah. 30 kilometres away hadn't been successful for a mm. grant, mm -hmm. and that application mm. was made by a 40 year old mm. white male, mm -hmm. then I think there would be a danger of an accusation from there. When you hear that observation, that perhaps there will be people saying, well, they only got it because they had a brown man at the top. Do you find it offensive? Yeah, I do actually a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I find it offensive. Yeah, I do. It was an awkward moment, and it shows just how uncomfortable it can be to talk about race. It's been a year of difficult conversations about race. Is anything changing? The government's planning a new law to protect statues from being removed. In Bristol, the statue of Edward Colston is being prepared for a museum display. For me, seeing this, it's a symbol of struggle, but things in society haven't changed. The Black Lives Matter movement and the anti-racist movement, which has you know, been going on for centuries, hasn't it, um, wasn't about statues. The statues are a symbol of the you know, the problems in society around inequality. Has Colston, in fact, by its very nature, this statue by its very nature, sparked a turning point in terms of the conversation around race? One of the things that I really see as a change, now we're hearing that it's not enough to just be non-racist, you have to be anti-racist. You have to be actively calling it out. You have to be prepared to argue with your family if necessary, and you actually have to be prepared to make a stand. The city is now trying to decide what should take the slave traders' place. 
I see the opportunity with the empty plinth to be an opportunity to open up dialogue between people that actually, you know, they, they, they're conflicted. And now is the time to heal rather than kind of gloat to say the statue's been toppled, really. In June, after the Black Lives Matter protests, the government ordered a commission to look into race and ethnic disparities in education, criminal justice, health and employment. A date for its release is yet to be announced. We need an acknowledgement that race has a significant impact in terms of the life experiences of black and minority ethnic individuals. Once we first acknowledge that, then we can move forward and make changes. Black people don't want to be seen through a prism of victimhood. They just want to be treated equally and fairly, but they also want what's happened in the past to be acknowledged and to be put right. Racism has become so polarised um, and so controversial that people are scared to weigh in on the debate in case they might say something wrong or they might be labelled a racist themselves or that they know nothing about the subject. Um, and that's actually uh, quite problematic. You can't really have progress unless you, know, you involve the entirety of the population. The conversations I've been part of have been very honest and sometimes painful. People opened up about racism and voiced their fears and frustrations. It feels different to the way I've heard people talk about it before. That's significant. Maybe it's a start. I think people generally need to be more self-reflective because I think it's very easy to jump to conclusions and, and form opinions without really thinking them through. Going beneath the surface and exploring different people's viewpoints, exploring your own understanding. It's really important that parents help their children to see beyond their current situation and put themselves out there, not being self-conscious about being black in a white neighborhood or in a white school or in a white boardroom. I think when we begin to balance the scales, I think we'll see a lot more of us in those positions of influence and decision making. And despite the challenges, some of the people I've been speaking to do feel something is changing. The Black Lives Matter movement gave us a lot of new vocabulary to be able to speak about things and actually illustrate how we feel. Maybe the more that we talk about it, actually the more that people are listening, it makes me feel really hopeful for the future. It's been a secret for too long and we've been made to not say anything for too long. So now that we're speaking out and now that we're actually putting things out and we're showing that, look, there is racism and it needs to stop. I think it's, I think it's great. I think it's really good. Now is the time. Actor David Hillwood investigates why is COVID killing people of colour? Press red to watch now on iPlayer. With a mental health toolkit for these tough times, go online and look after yourself with the help of BBC Headroom.